Like if I was American and I'm not, I would say, hold on, what did we get for this 30 trillion in debt? Where's the Hoover Dam that we've built? Where's the Tennessee Valley Authority? Where's the high-speed rail leaks? When you pile on the debt, it's gotta be for productive stuff. If what you're doing is running up the credit card debt to fund your current spending, that's much more problematic. Few people have a better understanding of global investment markets than Louis Gav. CEO and co-founder of GavCal Research. He spent decades in Hong Kong building his research firm, and he oversees the firm's money management business. He's always one of the most popular speakers at our annual Strategic Investment Conference. Today, Louis and I discuss U.S. government debt. Does it finally matter? We'll also get into U.S.-China relations and Louis's top investment ideas. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're so close to 20,000 subscribers, and I'd like for you to join us in the conversation. Now, let's catch up with Louis Goff. Louis, my friend, it's always good to see you. First thing I wanna ask you about is, are we finally at the point in the United States where debt is actually starting to matter? It's, uh, it's that old Ben Stein rule, right? If things can't go on, uh, they won't. Look, great, uh, great to be here, Ed. I, I always love catching up with you. Thanks, thanks a lot for having me. I think that's the right question. I think this is undeniably uh, the most important question right now. I think if you look at the past month, the TLT is down, what, something like 9% or something, that, you know, the long-dated US ETF. Frankly, on, on fairly low news, right? It's, it's not like we've had the Fed say anything. It's not... Like we have a political crisis in the U.S. We've had the, the, the debt ceiling thing pass, what was it, back in March, I think. Um, on, ver on basically no news whatsoever. In fact, inflation data looks like it's been softer and rolling over. Growth hasn't been that strong. All of a sudden, out of the blue, U.S. Treasuries at the long end puke out 9%. And this is, you know, the single most important asset class in the world. Um, the deepest, most liquid market. All of a sudden, you know, and it is it pricing in higher inflation? I don't think so. Is it pricing in much stronger growth? I, I also don't think so. So then you're left with, so what is it pricing? Is it pricing in the fact that the fiscal situation in the U.S. is getting too stressed? And here, I'll, I'll just throw a couple of numbers your way, you know, going back to this Ben Stein rule. Um, if you look at the U.S., the U.S. is roughly 4% of the global population. The U.S. budget deficit today is 40% of the world's budget deficits. So you add up all the world's budget deficits together, the U.S. is uh, is 40%. Um, and if you add up all of the world's current account deficits, so you take all the countries that have current account deficits, the U.S. is now 60% of, of the world's current account deficits. Um, so 4% of the world's population makes 40% of the world's budget deficit, 60% of the world's current account deficits, which means that... You know, concretely, what does that mean? That means that to keep the show on the road, the U.S. has to attract year in, year out, roughly between half and two thirds of the world's marginal increase in savings. Like if that money that the savings between roughly, let's say, two thirds of the world's savings don't flow to the U.S. every year, then you're either going to have a problem with the debt or a problem on the U.S. dollar. Um, and maybe we're there. You know, maybe that's that, that's where we are now, where... The, the U.S. fiscal situation has been such where it's like, you know what, we're going to pile in a trillion and a half of additional debts every year while our interest costs rise by three or four hundred billion dollars additional every year. Uh, the numbers just start getting too big. It's too big for the foreigners to fund. It's too big for U.S. private savers to, to fund. And it's too big for even the U.S. commercial banks to fund, or at least it's too big for them to fund with an inverted yield curve. Uh, because, you know, why would U.S. commercial banks run out and buy the long end of the yield curve when the yield curve is that inverted? So, you know, now what strikes me is that all this writing was, it was all very visible six or nine months ago, which is why I think when we last talked, I said, I'll believe I'll be like St. Thomas. I'll, I'll believe QT when I see it. I, I, I genuinely I was looking at these numbers and I thought, no way can the Fed back off because if you do, you're going to get a funding crisis in the U.S. at some point. Um, but the, the Fed did back off. I was wrong. The Fed did back off, um, and now bond yields are creeping up, and they're creeping up, of course, for the government. But actually, perhaps the bigger story, even bigger than TLT, is the mortgages. 
Yeah, like, you know, long dated mortgages in the US are now seven and a half percent. Um, and I think they're at what? They're like a 20 year high. They're at levels we haven't seen since 2002. Um, so yeah, you look at this and you think, okay, maybe this isn't a problem because a bunch of people locked in long mortgage rates when mortgage rates were low. But guess who didn't lock in their mortgage rates? Guess who didn't lock in their low interest rates? The US government. <laughs> like, and this is what makes this cycle so odd is corporates locked in the low interest rates, individuals locked in the low interest rates, and the government believed its own propaganda that interest rates would stay low forever and dramatically shorten the duration of their debt. So the, it's actually the government that is seeing the interest costs go through the roof. So logically, in this part of the cycle, the government should be tightening its belt, but it's doubling down. So it's a very odd cycle, very odd cycle. Well, the other thing that I caught you comment on is inflation in the U.S. and how the government can't really be taking inflation that seriously if at a time when we've got historically low unemployment numbers, you know, times are relatively great, and yet we're running these huge deficits. It makes no sense. No, look, I, I, hand on my heart, if three years ago you'd have told me, hey, Louis, in 2023, the U.S. government will be running budget deficits of 8% of GDP, and at the same time, the U.S. will have full employment, I would have thought, you know, you, you wore 10 hats in bed. Um, I would have thought you were ready for the loony bin. Uh, but yet here we are, you know, here we are to your point, um, which does beg the question, well, what happens if and when the U.S. hits a recession? Because you know that each time there's a recession, the budget deficit deteriorates by three or four percent of GDP. Um, so we're at eight today. If tomorrow there's a recession, I'm not saying there is going to be a recession, I'm just, I'm just saying if there is a recession, then you move to what, 11, 12 percent uh, budget deficit, then that means that all of a sudden you're 50 or 60% of the world's budget deficits, that you have to suck in even more of the world's savings just to keep the show on the road at a time when already, given the current numbers, you can't. So the big problem is at the next recession, who steps up to fund you know, the, the increase in the budget deficit? And I think we all know the answer. There's only one guy in town who can do it. Uh, and he's speaking uh, right now in Jackson Hole. Uh, there's only one guy who can do this. It's Jay Powell. So at this point, the only question becomes, all right, when, when does the Fed throw in the towel and, you know, and stops pretending that they're not going to fund the, the, the big increase in the U.S. budget deficit? Because deep down, you know, look, do you think central banks have two mandates or three mandates? Like if you think their mandates are price stability and employment, then you think the Fed doesn't do anything. I tend to think they have three mandates, price stability, employment, and financial market stability. And they've shown time and time again that financial market stability actually trump in a crisis that trumps the other two. Um, not that it's to, you know, the, the only question mark is when does this happen? And once it happens, how much does the U.S. dollar fall? Well, if the Fed steps in again, right? I mean, we've, we're coming off of a period When the where... Fed steps in again. So, so, okay. So when the Fed steps in again, they're going to be stepping in at a time where they've already let, uh, since its peak, I have a, I have a chart here. We peaked at just a hair under, uh, $9 trillion on the Fed's balance sheet, yep. just a hair, maybe a hundred billion, but what's a hundred billion among friends. Fine. Uh, and they've let about 800 billion burn off, which is a humongous number. But when you look at it on the chart, it's just a little blip because, the total stack of, of their balance sheet is so huge. How, how much do you think they can let burn off before they have to hit the pause button? <laughs> Unfair question. I, no, I, no, no, I, admit. I, 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 I don't know, but it seems to me that we're in go time right now. You know, again, mortgage rates are seven and a half percent. How high do you think they can go? Do you think they can go to eight? Yeah, maybe. Do you think they can go to nine? I think, you know, I think you start seeing problems. Um, uh, I think you've already started to see the weaker banks go by the wayside. Um, you know, can you have many more banks go by the wayside? Um, you know, I actually, I just dropped off my son in college and, you know, he didn't have a U.S. bank account. So we went to open a, him a bank account uh, when I dropped him off and we opened one with Chase. And out of curiosity, I said, oh, what's your, you know, what's the interest on the savings rate? And it was like 0.05. 
not five percent, wow. like zero point zero five percent. So you know, the banks are still like the big money, the big money banks, your Chase, your Bank of America, etc., still don't have, they still haven't raised their interest rates. So they're still sitting, they're still sitting pretty. Actually, those guys. I mean, if you can get deposits at zero and lend it out to the government at five, you're laughing. Um, but of course, you know, the more interest rates rise, at this point, why isn't every American just buying a mortgage bond at seven and a half instead of keeping money in a savings deposit, right? Um, but that, that, that seems like, a, so, you know, how much more can it go? I would say, no. look again, long bond yields have just gone down. I mean, TLT has just gone down 9% in a month or no news. Shocking. Me, yeah, it's like, to me, this is telling me, and so, and once again, TLT has gone down twice as much as the S&P 500. So once again, long bonds are doing precisely the opposite of what they're supposed to do. You know, when you lose 5% on your S&P 500, you would hope that your long bonds would be up two or three and cushion the shock. You don't expect them to be done down twice as much. So we're, I think we're in go time now. Like the, the meltdown we're starting to see in long dated bonds, that's the story. That's the story of the summer. Uh, you wouldn't know it looking at the media, you know, we've had now had two covers back to back of The Economist t- t- telling us about Chinese implosion. Um, you know, it's China imploding. After six weeks of Ukraine is winning every day, we now get six weeks of China is imploding every day. Um, at some point, the media narrative will shift and, and be like, hold on, seven and a half percent mortgage rates is starting to dish out the pain. But, you know, it, it's funny. We live in a world where media lat- latches on on the narrative uh, you know, keeps running with it for six weeks and then moves on to the next thing. I think that the, the China's imploding narrative, which was the one prevalent for the next six weeks, is starting to run out of steam. The next one will be, hold on, these higher interest rates are trying to cause some real pain. Yeah, everything that we just talked about gets very little coverage in, in financial media, let alone broader media. And yet you're right. Uh, every day it's China's on the uh, edge of a precipice. Uh, China's got a debt explosion ha- happening. Meanwhile, on and this... You- since you know, Go ahead. since I brought it up, but you picked it up, so I'll keep running with it. Funny story: um, if you look at Chinese bank shares over the past twelve months, you know they're basically flat. They're up marginally; they're up like three or four percent. If you look at U.S. bank shares over the past twelve months, they're down twenty percent. So you're like, okay, I'm supposed to worry about like China's having this EM systemic crisis, but its bank shares are outperforming U.S. Bank- its bank shares are outperforming U.S. Treasuries. You know. You know, what you call an emerging market systemic crisis in which the local debt market, the local stock market, and the local bank shares all outperform U.S. treasuries by more than double digits. Um, I think you can call it one of two things. You can call it either unprecedented, because it would be, or you can call it inexistent. You choose. Um, But, you know, everybody's banging on about how China's getting through this crisis. Our annual prices are up 50% since late October. The LVMH share price is close to all-time highs. It's like, you know, all of the things you would look for in the market if the economist cover was correct, you can't see, you can't find. You know, the Chinese stock markets have not been great. They're like, they haven't been, but they're still up between 10 and 20% from late October when China reopened. So it's not great. It's been disappointing. Don't get me wrong. It's disappointing, but it's not a systemic crisis. You know, let, let's, let, let's, keep, let's keep the hyperbole uh, in check. You wrote about kind of what, what is under pressure in China right now, and it's essentially uh, high yield debt. Yep. High yield debt is under pressure. But it's been, and, it's been for two years. You know, high yeah, yield and, and who owns that? The, yeah, yeah. Who, the who high yield debt market is broken. But the high yield debt market, to your point, high yield debt market is all property developers that have issued a lot of debt. And remember, the government hates them, so they don't really want to bail those guys out. And that debt's been bought by foreign hedge funds, who the government also hates. And and then it's like, you know, I feel like I'm in bizarro world where you have editorials in the Wall Street Journal where that are basically berating, you know, the Wall Street Journal, like, you know, the most red blooded, you know, press or press of, you know, red blooded capitalists telling the Chinese Communist government they need to intervene more in the economy. It's like it, it is bizarre. It's like. It's like I'm taking crazy pills. This is, yes. this is like the world turned yes. upside down. We're all berating. Same thing again with The Economist. The past two weeks, 
it's like editorials, like the economy is supposed to be, you know, the classically liberal, uh, you know, laissez-faire ec ec economist telling you, telling the Chinese government, you need to intervene to, to bail out the property developers. It's like, why? Like my, fi my financial system is not imploding because property developer loans amount to 6% of total developer loans in China. So yes, it's a problem. Yes, it's going to lead to weaker growth, but my banks are not imploding. And if banks aren't imploding, you don't have a systemic crisis. It's truly shocking how normalized bailouts have become in this country. I think this, it's part of that. I think it's all this is a legacy of 2008. I think we all have PTSD from 2008. So, you know, we, we all, we see, oh my God, Chinese property prices are down 10 to 20%. Oh my God, property developers are going bust. Oh my God, some financial intermediaries are in trouble. Uh, I've seen this movie before. This is going to be terrible. You know, run for the bunkers, uh, get the get the hard outs and, and, and uh, you know, shelter in place. But, you know, between January 2007 and July 15th, 2008, or two months before Lehman went bust, American bank shares were down 60%. I think bank shares are often the best leading indicators of problems. You know, European bank shares puked the year before the European crisis. Uh, U.S. bank shares, as I just mentioned, puked. Again, in the past 12 months, Chinese bank shares are essentially flat. And then... It's not that it's awesome business and you should go out to rush and buy them. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying they're not that Chinese bank shares aren't announcing you have crisis. Neither is the iron ore price, neither is the share price of LVMH, neither, the, neither is, the, is the Chinese government bond market, neither is the Chinese stock market. So aside from the cover of the Wall Street Journal and The Economist, you struggle to see where the China crisis is. Can we talk a little bit about U.S.-China relations? Because, sure. boy, it sure does feel tense. Uh, and, and it feels like... Anything and everything that can be weaponized, uh, weaponized in quotes, um, it is being weaponized. It feels very hot. How do you see this playing out? Is this temporary? Is this permanent? Are yeah, we right. decoupling completely? Look, it's, it, it's permanent. And here, I think part of the disconnect is, you know, if you ask any American, what's the biggest comparative advantage of the United States? Americans will say, well, we have the world's best universities, or we have a rule of law, or we have, you know, some of the world's best managers, uh, you know, and any number of things, uh, which happen to be true, of course. Now, ask any foreigner, what's the biggest comparative advantage of the United States? Going back to this 4% of the population running 60% of the world's current account deficit and 40% of the world's budget deficit, they'll say the U.S. is the U.S. dollar. You know, the U.S. has the world's reserve currency, which allows them to do things like run 60% of the world's current account deficit. And you know, attract all of the world's savings. Um, now, starting 10 years ago, China deliberately went gunning for that comparative advantage of the United States. China came out and said, look, and you know, I've talked about this many times at, uh, at the Malden SICs. This has been a, you know, a key feature of my thinking for the past 10 years. I've done presentation after presentation on this. I've written books on this. Um, you know, when China came out 10 years ago and said, we want to de-dollarize our trade. We want to make the RMB a trading currency. We want to make the RMB bond market a global reference. That was a direct attack to the U.S. Um, and and so yeah, so there you know, no wonder the U.S. latches latches back, right? It's uh, China is trying to undermine the one thing that makes the U.S. truly exceptional. Now I know in American minds many things make the U U.S. exceptional, but in foreign minds that's that's it. That's what makes the U.S. truly exceptional. Um, and, and so, you know, we're in the middle, we're in the middle of this fight. Now, the one thing I would say is if I was the U S and I knew I was in this fight, I knew China was coming to try to undermine me, et cetera, running budget deficits of 8% of GDP while running full employment would not be the way I'd go about this fight. Um, you know, I would start to say, okay, I'm under attack. I got a clean house. I got to basically do what Clinton did in the late nineties. Um, you know, run budget surpluses and run a much tighter ship, uh, make my currency actually deeply attractive to, to foreigners. Um, you know, when was the last time you heard a U.S. policymaker talk about the strong dollar policy? That was like a, a 1990s thing. You know, you, you, you haven't heard, heard, heard about that for, for a while. So, uh, so that battle is on. Now, that battle 
is going to be, it's been the big story of the past 10 years in my eyes. It's going to be even, an even bigger story for, for the next 10 years, partly because de-dollarization is not an event. It's a process. It's something that happens very, very slowly. Um, but it is, it is unfolding. You know, the fact that you now have five of the world's top eight producers of oil in the world that have signed up to the BRICS um, uh, agreements where the, the stated aim is to de-dollarize commodity trade should be ringing all sorts of alarm bells. You know, the fact that Saudi, Egypt, UAE, et cetera, just signed up for this, that should be signed. So again, it's a process. It's not, it's not an event, it's a process. And we are in this process. Um, so yeah, the US and China are, you know, on this clash now, uh, you know, along this process, there's ebbs and flows. Um, and I think things got pretty bad lately with the whole shooting of the balloon, um, the whole China not picking up uh, Biden's phone calls, etc. Things are now better and things are now better and they will likely be better for the near term um, because you have an APEC summit coming up in November in California. And the reality is both Biden and she need that summit to go well um, for, for, for simply for pure domestic political reasons. Um, and so, you know, I think as between now and November, as you come into the APEC summit, you know, all of a sudden the diplomats are back to talking with each other. All of a sudden there's, you know, high, high end delegations, you know, you had Yellen come to Beijing, you had Kerry come to Beijing, you saw Kissinger come to Beijing. So it seems like both through front channels and back channels, things are, you know, a, a bit better. My guess is, you know, try to make nice till the APEC summit. Then after that, you move into an electoral year in the U.S. where probably nothing much happens anyway. Um, then after that, you have also two big events. The first really important event in the relationship is the Taiwanese election coming up in late January. Uh, and, and here, you know, you have a candidate that's very pro-independence against a candidate that's very pro-let's get together with China. Now... If the pro-independence government, a pro-independence candidate wins, that's a real problem. Um, that's a real problem, especially during an election year in the U.S., where the China bashing always ratchets up a little bit. Uh, so that could create lots of tensions there. If the KMT candidate wins, and you know, then China relaxes a lot. And in fact, instead of rat you know, instead of rattling the cage, China will then make overtures to, uh, Taiwan will make overtures to China and China will open the checkbook. They'll be, they'll, they'll shower the KMT candidates with gift with a basically pretty clear view of look at what happens when you play nice, you know. Um, and, and the first thing the KMT candidate will do is he'll ask the 300 Marines that the U.S. recently sent to China to go home. And that will be a huge sigh of relief in China, because that's a huge red line for China, to have foreign troops sitting in Taiwan, huge red line. So, um, so yeah, so you've got, in, in terms of the timeline, November, you got the APEC summit. I think we play nice until then. Then everybody's on pause and waits for the Taiwanese election. And if the KMT guys wins, then I think China's a non-issue till after the election. We've been following at Malden Economics the the reshoring, friendshoring, nearshoring trend, critical manufacturing being brought back to the U.S. shores, if the CHIPS Act, huge uh, investments in silicon wafer plants, uh, fabs being being built in the U.S. What is your view on, on trade between the two? I feel like this reshoring trend is pretty unstoppable, um, but it really is going to hinge on automation. I, I don't think you can make the same products for the same price on U.S. soil that you could in Taiwan or anywhere in Asia, really. You follow robotics and automation closely. You've been involved in some in an ETF around the, the topic. Where are we at in terms of the evolution of robotics and the shortage of chips to, to, to fuel that growth? Look, we've had a shortage of chips and we've also had a shortage of workers, right? I mean, pretty much everywhere you care to look. So... No, look, I think the tailwinds for automations uh, remain great. Now, to your point, um, you know, I think the, the big buzzword of recent years has been deglobalization, right? Yeah. Um, which I think is a complete misnomer. Um, 
we shouldn't call it deglobalization. We should call it designification. Uh, and it's not, it's not exactly the same thing. Um, because what you have is factories leaving China, but it doesn't mean that they move to Cleveland or to Duluth. Um, instead, they move to Mexico. They move to Indonesia. They move to Vietnam. Um, so, you know, the U.S. says, well, we don't, want to, we don't feel comfortable having our production in a communist country, so let's move to Vietnam. And, <laughs> you know, don't, but practically that's, a, that's, what, that's what's happening. The reality is that there's two ways to look at this. Two ways to look at the the whole. Hmm, I don't feel that comfortable about China anymore. The first way is to say there's a number of countries that, that are winning out big time from this: Indonesia, Vietnam, Mexico, um, uh, countries in emerging markets. Um, and this you already see very clearly in the numbers. Like you look at Mexican exports to the U.S. surging, Vietnamese exports to the U.S. surging. Now, you know our big line on this was that. A lot of these factories leaving, we're probably going to leave anyway, um, at least to the place like Vietnam or Indonesia because of higher labor costs, et cetera. And that it was mostly lower value added stuff. So it was sort of like crumbs falling off of China's table. Now, if you're Vietnam, you can feast on these crumbs. If you're Indonesia, you can feast on these crumbs. Um, but the, the mix of China's exports as a result has shifted dramatically in the past 10 years. You know, when we think of China exports in the West, I think we still think of tennis shoes and cotton underwear. Um, meanwhile, China is now the biggest automobile exporter in the world uh, from, from nowhere five years ago. Mm -hmm. China now exports more cars than either South Korea, Japan, or Germany. Mm -hmm. Few people realize this, mm -hmm. but, uh, but there you have it. Uh, you know, broadly the same story in earth moving equipment, uh, telecom switches, et cetera. So you've had to you know, move up the value chain that's been tremendous, and you pass on all the lower value added stuff, the textiles, the shoes, the toys, the furniture to, to, to other countries. So, so that's your first trend. The second trend is, is the one you highlight, the, the robotics. Um, and here I think you know, the US does have a tremendous comparative advantage relative to the rest of the Western world. So the US has a, a cost of energy that's a fraction of anybody else's one. And, um, and so here, uh, you know, if what you're doing is quite energy intensive, if you're in chemical products, if you're in, you know, any one of any energy intensive, and you know, a lot of stuff that requires a lot of robotics is energy intensive, um, then the US actually does make sense, uh, potentially. So you're seeing uh, as well uh, s some of that. And then I think there's, there's a third part to the whole designification, which is, um, you know, where, where China produces stuff um, that we've let China produce. Think of the, all the rare earths, uh, but also the low-end semiconductors, et cetera. We've let China produce that either because it was polluting or because it was low value added or because China was very competitive. And now all of a sudden, we no longer feel comfortable doing this. And even though it makes no economic sense for us to bring it back into the West, we're, we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And so you get, you now all of a sudden you have big investments for rare earths and mines in, in Australia or in Canada or even in the US because, you know, it's geostrategically that's, uh, that uh, it just, just, just makes more sense. Um, but, you know, some of the stuff that's being done today, like building semiconductor plants in Arizona, I think that makes no sense. I mean, I, th I think that's just capital waste. And, you know, TSMC is doing it and they keep saying this is stupid. Like every chance they get, they're doing it because the U.S. is making them do it and they're doing it because the U.S. is giving them money for them to do it. But, you know, building semiconductor plants, semiconductor, you know, requires lots of water in one of the driest part of the U.S. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, it's boneheaded. Uh, uh, but, you know, politically it was decided that it should be Arizona because that's a purple state um, and complete, complete boneheaded, complete boneheaded. So just sheer capital waste. Uh, meanwhile, you could say, I, I can see why you wouldn't want your semiconductor plants in um, Taiwan because that could get invaded by China. But would, although I don't think it will, but, you know, conceptually I could see, okay, we don't want that. But then put them in South Korea, put them in, in Japan, where there's a long expertise in doing this kind of work. And you can do it maybe not as efficiently as Taiwan, but almost. 
as opposed to building from scratch in Arizona. Just stupid. There definitely seems to be strong, strong political will uh, and massive amounts of dollars going in that direction, though. So it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to deny that. Um, oh yeah. Well, for sure. From an investment perspective. No, no, for sure. But and and then it comes back to this. You know, the U.S. in the past twenty years has gone from what was it five or six trillion in debt to thirty two and a half today. 35 by January 2025 and probably before. So, you know, let's call it, you know, almost a $30 trillion increase in debt. What do you have to show for this money? Like if I was American, and I'm not, if I was American, I would say, hold on, we've just loaded 30 trillion in debt over the past generation. Where's the Hoover Dam that we've built? Where's the Tennessee Valley Authority? Where's the high-speed rail leaks? Where's the interstate highway system? Uh, like, what did we get for this $30 trillion in debt? And the reality is what you get is either pet political projects, like let's put fabs in Arizona. Um, so you get that. Obviously, you get wars. Um, and what you get uh, is increasingly transfer payments. Uh, because you look at the U.S., Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, plus interest payments are basically almost equal today to tax receipts. Um, so that's before you've paid anybody's salaries, before you've maintained any roads, before you've done any of these things. That's how you end up with a budget deficit of 8% of GDP. Um, and so, you know, the, the big problem is I have nothing against debt, but when you pile on the debt, it's got to be for productive stuff. You know, it's, you, you, you gotta, you're a company, you pile on debt because you're building a factory. You're an individual, you know, you pile on debt because you're getting a mortgage. If what you're doing is running up the credit card debt to fund your current spending, that's much more problematic. And that's where the U.S. is today, going back to how we started. Have we reached a point now where the U.S. annual increase in debt requires roughly two-thirds of the world's global savings to fund it? Uh, annual increase in savings. Have we reached a point where you know, the, the train starts going off the rails? And what scares me the most about this situation, Louis, you could probably count on one hand the number of congressmen and women who understand this. We have a disproportionate number of lawyers, so they understand law, and that's great, um, and legislation, but but I don't think they really understand the effects. And uh, was it Grant Williams who said just because something bad hasn't happened doesn't mean it can't happen? Probably, yeah. That, that sounds very Grant-like. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I fully agree with that, by the way. Is it that they don't understand? Um, I was recently told that the U.S. economy, because the U.S. economy, you know, is not not looking great. Raytheon and Lockheed have had to fire thirty congressmen. So, <laughs> so I think I think it's more of the latter. I'm I'm a firm believer of if people are paid to not see a problem, they're not going to see it. Um, and when you look at you know the cost of political campaigns in the U.S., when you look at look. You know, we're we're ramping up a, another towards another presidential election. Both parties are going to spend around a billion dollars just on the presidential election. Like people don't spend a billion, you know, they don't give millions of dollars without expecting some kind of payback. I don't think so. Nobody gives a billion dollar to Joe Biden because they think, or to Donald Trump because they think he's a terrific guy, such a lovely guy, such a terrific human being that they really want to see him in a position of power. Because how can you not love? either Joe Biden or Donald Trump. There's just such just awesome individuals that I have to give them a big chunk of my savings. I don't think it works that way. Let's end on a happy note. <laughs> yes. Sorry. <laughs> give, give me a couple of ideas, if you'd be so kind. Yeah, of course. Of uh, just a areas that, you, that you're interested in right now. You're like maybe commodities. Do you feel like commodities are still uh, a, a good opportunity? Uh, what, what, what do you like? Yeah, so I've liked commodities for a while. And I, like I, I, remain, I remain a very uh, firm buyer of commodities, partly because, look, I... I think if you're a capital allocator, you know, what's, what's your comparative advantage? What, you know, why, why do you get rewarded? Um, you know, your value add is to bring capital. Now, my own bias is to think, well, if I bring capital today to Microsoft, they're going to tell me, get in line. Everybody wants to give me capital. Um, I'm better off bringing capital to people who've been starved of capital, people who, 
you know, haven't had it now. The commodity sector has been starved of capital for the past 10 years. Meanwhile, you know, we all need commodities and we probably need commodities more than we ever have. Um, the, uh, you know, I think that the, there was this big hope for a few years that, oh, you know what, with windmills and basically, you know, with magic mirrors and windmills, we're going to be able to, you know, bypass our need for energy. We're going to bypass our need for commodities, et cetera. Uh, and it turns out to have been a pipe dream. We've spent $4 trillion in, in, uh, non, in, in uh, alternative energy um, over the past 20 years. And for that, we've managed to move from 83% carb from uh, 83% carbon down to 81% carbon. This is the, you know the, the gross one of the grossest misallocation of capital on record, um, and we haven't paid the piper for this yet. And the, the way we'll pay the piper is through higher commodity prices. Um, so I still think that the risk reward in commodities is an extremely extremely attractive one, uh, and there's many many ways to of course to to express that whether through metals whether through so I think that's you know one key theme. I think another key theme uh, out there is um, that for you know roughly 15, 20 years, the working class, uh, and by that I mean the blue collar class in uh, Western countries, kept seeing their income squeeze year in year out. Um, so if you were working in an office with a laptop and a, and a cell phone, you were doing great. If you were living in New York, if you're living in San Francisco, your income kept growing, uh, the interest rates kept coming down, your real disposable income, your assets kept going up in price, everything was awesome. And that cycle is now over. You're, you're seeing it every day, right? Right now, you got the UAW strike, you got you know, UPS workers making $170,000, um, and, and you know, farmers making a whole lot more money than they used to, oil rig workers making a ton more money, like, you know, Oil companies can't get enough oil rig workers. They can't get enough truck drivers. So these guys all of a sudden are like making proper money and their consumption patterns are very different than your laptop class in New York and San Francisco. You know, they're not going to buy avocado toast. They're going to buy a snowmobile or a pickup truck or um, a boat. Um, and by the way, those things are flying, you know, you, uh, RVs, like all these things. So I think there's, a, you know, all the... Um, and I don't think it's a one-year thing. I think it's, you know, we've trained an entire generation to look down on manual labor. Um, we've, we've told an entire generation, if you don't go to college, you'll be a nobody and nobody will respect you. And so, and, and so you can't, for the life, for love of money, you can't find a plumber and you can't find a carpenter and you can't find a truck driver. And that's not going to get fixed immediately. Um, it's going to have to be a cultural shift. And in the meantime, these guys are making money. So you want to own anything these guys want to buy. Um, so, cause that, that's a, that's a 10 year tailwind. Now, another, I think another story for me is, you know, I love the fact that the economist runs two covers back to back on China imploding. Uh, I love it. Um, I can today buy Alibaba at the same price as when it IPO'd and its sales are 11 to 12 times bigger than when it IPO'd. Um, you know, it's like the price to sale of Alibaba has just gone down 90%. Uh, love this. Now, you know, it's basically trading at valuations where either this thing goes bust and is a zero, or you should fill your boots with it. Um, and I, I like that kind of, of risk return profile, I, I must admit. Um, and it might not go up in the next year, but in the next five, this is, this is for sure a, a must own. Um, so... You know, and and it's not just Alibaba. There's, you know, I own I own BYD. You know, the biggest the biggest car company, uh, the biggest electric car company in the world in terms of production, not in terms of market cap. That's Tesla, of course. But you know, BYD now sells the BYD Seagull. It's a it's a small hatchback. Think of a Honda Civic. Um, it's a hatchback, full electric, two hundred twenty mile radius, eleven thousand US dollars, like that. How can anybody compete with that car? The answer is they can't. They just started selling them in Australia. They sold 10,000 in the first 24 hours. And then they, they, that, that was it. That's all they had. Like the first 10,000, gone. Boom. So now they got to send another 10,000. But because at, at that price point, you can put it on your credit card uh, almost. Right. Um, so, you know, there's, there's lots of exciting things going on. But perhaps the most exciting things of them all, the one that, 
the Western world is missing is the one I talked about at the SIC, is the fact that, you know, due to geopolitical developments, both the Ukraine-Russia war and the Iran-Saudi Arabia peace deal, you have an outpouring of infrastructure spending on an axis that basically goes from Istanbul to Jakarta that is simply unprecedented. Pipelines, roads, railroads being built because commodities that used to go west from Russia towards Europe now have to go south and east. So that requires commodities. Uh, commodities, funnily enough, they are now priced in local currency. So there is no constraint to the infrastructure spending because before you were constrained by your ability to get access to dollars. Now you're just constrained by your own ability to print the money to buy the commodities from Russia, whether you're India, whether you're Indonesia, whether you're Brazil, uh, whether you're China, of course. So I look at emerging markets and there's three massive, massive trends. The first is the de-dollarization of the commodity trade means that the constraint to infrastructure spending is basically being removed. The second is de -signification. factories moving from China to everywhere else in the emerging markets. And the third is the unfolding commodity bull market. Because for all the bearishness out there, as I mentioned earlier, iron ore prices are grinding higher. Copper is not falling apart. Energy prices are grinding higher. Um, and so you put all these three things together. And historically, again, when commodity prices rose, countries like India would blow up. Countries like China would slow down. But now that they price it in their own currencies, now that you, know, you can buy the oil in renminbi, the oil price no longer matters if you're China. It's like, yeah, print, print the renminbi, give me more oil. So... It's, it's a dramatic shift that I don't think has been reflected in people's portfolios yet. So tons and tons of opportunities, lots of places. If you want to hear more about energy from one of my favorite energy analysts, check out this conversation with Jan Stuart of Piper Sandler. 